For more than 13 years, President Franklin D. Roosevelt led the United States through war and economic crisis. Upon his death, this beloved man was mourned by millions of his fellow citizens. President Roosevelt managed many transitions during his time in office. Many believe that FDR rescued his nation, and some say the world in dealing with the Depression and World War II. His death on April 12, 1945 signified the end of an era and many new beginnings. Many institutions will emerge transformed from this time, especially political institutions. Harry S. Truman was sworn in upon FDR's death. Many monumental tasks and big decisions were put on his desk, for he was to end World War II and construct a lasting peace. The former Missouri senator kept up the momentum on many of FDR's policies, but President Truman had to make one of the toughest decisions any president could ever make. dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. With this devastating weapon, World War II was brought to an end. By 1948, Republicans, who had been out of office since 1932, settled on John Dewey, governor of the state of New York, as their nominee for president. You have laid upon me the highest duty to which an American can be called. No one has the right to refuse such a call. With the help of God, I shall try to be worthy of the trust. I accept the nomination. In 1948, the Democratic Party was fractured into three parts. The Progressive Party, led by former Vice President Henry A. Wallace, represented the liberal wing of the Democratic Party. Wallace and Idaho Senator Glenn Taylor formed the Progressive Party ticket. I tell you, Franklin, that in obtaining the nomination of the Progressive Party, a nomination which I accept with pride, The other breakaway faction of the Democratic Party were the Southern Dixiecrats. They broke with the mainstream Democratic Party over the issue of civil rights. Their presidential and vice presidential candidates included former South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond and Fielding Wright. I always believed in, and we continue to express our belief in, the right of every individual, regardless of race, color, or creed, is the right to, to live, to work, to vote, and full and equal protection of the laws on the basis of equality for all people as under the rights of our Constitution. Everybody knows that I recommended to the Congress a civil rights program. I did so because I believe it to be my duty under the Constitution. Some of the members of my own party disagree with me violently on this matter. While taking bold positions and facing a fractured party, Harry Truman faced an uphill re-election campaign. John Dewey ran a very safe campaign. He was cautious and calculating with his campaign. Rejecting taking direct attacks on President Truman and basically riding the strength of early popularity polls, John Dewey seemed to have it all on automatic. But President Truman led a spirited campaign attacking the Congressional Republicans. If the Congressional elements that made the Taft-Hartley law are allowed to remain in power, and if these elements are further encouraged by the election of a Republican president, you men of labor can expect to be hit by a steady barrage of body blows. 
And if you stay at home, as you did in 1946, and keep these reactionaries in power, you deserve every blow you get. And so, in the 1948 presidential election, incumbent President Harry S. Truman wins re-election over Governor John Dewey by more than 3 million votes, surprising many observers. I am today announcing my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. The presidency is the most powerful office in the free world. Through its leadership can come a more vital life for all of our people. In it are centered the hopes of the globe around us for freedom and a more secure life. Senator Kennedy, if you don't win the presidential nomination, will you accept the vice presidency? I shall not on any conditions be a candidate for vice president if I fail in this endeavor, I shall return and uh, serve uh, in the United States Senate. In early 1960, John F. Kennedy kicked off his campaign for President of the United States. A younger, unorthodox politician for his time, John Kennedy took his message to the people. John F. Kennedy, senator from the state of Massachusetts, would face off in early Democratic primaries against Senator Hubert H. Humphrey. Minnesota Senator Humphrey, a longtime Democratic Party stalwart, would give John Kennedy his first real electoral competition. You see, I sort of feel like an independent merchant uh, competing against a chain store when I compete with the Kennedy family. <laughs> a well-oiled political machine. The Kennedy campaign was run primarily by Robert Kennedy, who engineered primary victories in many states. Kennedy would eventually secure the Democratic Party's nomination and name Lyndon Johnson as his running mate. And the stage was set for the Democrats in 1960. Richard Nixon, vice president serving under President Dwight D. Eisenhower, enjoyed many advantages in the 1960 election. For Nixon, having been vice president for eight years was the best advantage. But in televised debates, both candidates squared off against each other in their positions. I know that there are those who say that we want to turn everything over to the government. I don't at all. I want the individuals to meet their responsibility. And I want the states to meet their responsibility. But I think there is also a national responsibility. The argument has been used against every piece of social legislation in the last 25 years. The people of the United States individually could not have developed the Tennessee Valley. Collectively, they could have. America's prestige abroad will be just as high as the spokesman for America allow it to be. Now, when we have a presidential candidate, for example, Senator Kennedy, stating over and over again that the United States is second in space, and the fact of the matter is that the space score today is 28 to 8. We've had 28 successful shots, they've had 8. When he states that we're second in education, and I have seen Soviet education, and I've seen ours, and we're not, that we're second in science, because they may be ahead in one area or another, when overall we're way ahead of the Soviet Union and all other countries in science. When he says, as he did in January of this year, that we have the worst slums, that we have the most crowded schools, when he says that 17 million people go to bed hungry every night, when he makes statements like this, what does this do to American prestige? Media coverage of the 1960 election was unprecedented for its time. The style and scope of the media coverage, coupled with new technology, gave the American people a lot of information to consider for the 1960 election. Ultimately, in the closest election in U.S. history, John F. Kennedy prevailed over Richard Nixon by less than 200,000 votes. Choices this year are between two different visions of the future. 
two fundamentally different ways of governing. Their government of pessimism, fear, and limits, or ours of hope, confidence, and growth. This is a fundamental and basic debate about the nature of America. Have we become some sort of jungle? We're just the richest or the fittest, whatever that means, prosper. We are not a selfish people. The 1984 presidential campaign would be one of firsts. Reverend Jesse Jackson would be the first African-American candidate who won primaries and was a serious contender for the Democratic Party nomination. I want to serve the American family. My candidates are all the hope for the American family and for our youth. Other candidates running for the Democratic Party's nomination against the front-runner Mondale in 1984 were Senators John Glenn and Gary Hart. 90% of the new jobs in this society have come from small businesses, and I think the, the dedication of the Democratic Party to minority people in the South and elsewhere shouldn't just be jobs. It should be the opportunity to own and operate businesses that create jobs. Mr. Glenn, you respond to that? Well, we'll, get, we'll come back to it. Let some of the others know about coming out for entrepreneurs. You know, when I when I hear when I hear what the when I hear when I hear your new ideas, I'm reminded of that ad. Where's the beef? Yeah. Well, Once Mondale won the Democratic nomination, another barrier was broken with the selection of Geraldine Ferraro as Mondale's running mate for vice president. She would be the first woman ever selected for the job. Democrats would have their work cut out for them in 1984, running against a popular incumbent president. By 1984, the incumbent Reagan administration moved with significant momentum, lowering unemployment and interest rates at home while taking a tough stance on foreign policy, the Reagan administration was an immovable object. With his campaign theme of Warning in America, which focused on patriotism and America's symbolism, President Reagan convinced Americans that it would be good to give him four more years as their president. With that call centered around the theme of Warning in America, on election night in 1984, President Reagan was able to rack up victory after victory in state after state. Once the dust settled, it was the largest electoral college and popular vote landslide in U.S. history. Mondale could only muster a win in the District of Columbia and his home state of Minnesota, making the 1984 election the most lopsided in history. Thank you.